Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another episode of Mind Your Body and Soul. I am Joseph Ward, and Matias will be joining us in a minute. You know Matias being these streets do already do, but shout out to him anyway. But welcome back to another episode of Mind Your Body and Soul. And Mind Your Body and Soul is an educational podcast that focuses on all things health related to help our listeners learn more about the various health topics and information they may not have access to. We seek to inform, empower, uplift, and mobilize our listeners to becoming the healthiest versions of themselves. And remember, you can catch us once a week on our website at www.nmcpodcast.com, as well as our parental website at www.neighborhoodmedicalcenter.org. You can also catch us right here on our Neighborhood Medical Center YouTube channel, as well as Anchor, Breaker, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Spotify, and Google Podcast. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, um, Neighborhood Heroes on Instagram or just type in Neighborhood Medical Center and like our Facebook page as well because we are here in these internet streets and we're trying to make sure we bring our outreach to the internet streets, I guess I'm going to say it like that. But uh, happy to be here, happy to have another good interview going on. Um, you all you all need to, uh, need to be excited about this interview. This is a special interview for me. Um, this this gentleman I met, I think we met. Uh, it's all I know. It's it's been it's over ten years ago. Oh, yeah. Met over ten years ago. I was working at the health department uh, at the time. It was he came in when we. It was a it was a two or three year period where all the interns that we was coming in, they was like great. They was they were great. So he came in in this in this group of interns who were great, but he also had a different edge about him a different disposition a mature disposition about himself he came in with purpose he came in with that direction structure discipline he knew what he wanted to do he had a vision had a goal for himself and we were able to help him reach some of the goals and things that he's had um, outside of that he's been able to make a mark for himself in the mental health realm working as a counselor working in forensics working in in uh detoxing working in different capacities from um for working as a supervisor to an administrator, and then going on to start his own business to his own uh, organization, which is a new life counseling and consulting. He's the CEO of that. Uh, one of the one of the best people I've met in this Tallahassee area, as far as when we're uh, providing for our community, giving back to our community, and making sure that we're serving people. He's a definitely a servant leader and somebody that we are happy to have in our community. And I'm speaking of Mr. Drake Gunning. So all y'all people in virtual world, get y'all hands together and get up out y'all seat, Mr. Drake Gunning. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Joseph, I definitely appreciate that. Welcome, man. <laughs> look, man, look, I really appreciate it. <laughs> you you deserve it, bro. Like you, you are one of the ones. There, there's there's standout people that came through this health department. Like you, Alexandra Washington, um, it's it's a lot of other ones, but I know because because I've been able to see your journey. Because uh, there are others who I think are great, but I didn't have as much. Uh, I didn't have the front seat to see their journey, see them going. But that's why I named the names that I named because being able to see that up front. But man, I'm so proud of you, bro. Like you, you you took the ball and ran, and that's that's one of the things that. Uh, I appreciate about you being in that environment because I had to do the same thing. But the ones like, give me the ball, coach. You wanted the ball in the situations. You wanted to be able to make sure that you can contribute. And through all of that, you you took that onto your own lane and, and built your own lane for yourself. So I know the people who come see you are in great hands. Well, I appreciate that. But, you know, also credit to the health department because, you know, when I came in there, it was definitely – um, structure in a way to where there was there was pressure put on you to succeed, right? To be the best person you can be. Where a lot of places you go, they kind of give you the bare minimum. Hey, yeah. put some papers, do this, do that. But the way you guys operated through Sam Carter, uh, Mr. Leroy, um, you know, you guys kind of set set the tone of, hey, this is how we operate. You know, we're self sufficient, self reliant, self motivating. You know, pretty much, can you hang with us or not? Right, like the big dog. So you know, kind of forced <laughs> me to grow. A little bit, but you know, I definitely thank God that it worked out. Um, and I was able to express my vision and express myself and also find find out new things about myself, you know, through working with you all. So yeah, you know, I definitely contribute to you guys and I often talk about that experience a lot 
um, to my other interns, and that, I kind of catered my the way I did internship that way. And folks yeah. I talked to, I mean, that was that was a once a lifetime experience I would never forget. <laughs> nah, I definitely appreciate that, and it was it was a great experience. It was just oh, yeah. it was definitely a great experience. So, um, I know I know a little more information about you. Uh, I know our mm-hmm. viewers don't, so. Um, you don't necessarily have to give your whole biography, but just giving out with viewers some background information about yourself and what made you choose the field of mental health. Sure, sure. So I went into the mental health field in 2006 um, while I was at school at FAM working my undergrad in psychology. I worked as a mental health assistant um, in an inpatient unit. So I worked, you know, work at nights, go to school during the day. So you can imagine that roller coaster ride. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from there, you know, because I I thought about wanting to do to do therapy, but being in that environment, it really made me love therapy even more and mental health even more because I was able to see people at their lowest or see different diagnoses at its full bloom. You know, whether it be a schizophrenic mm-hmm. client or uh, someone who's going through bipolar, because you know when you're going to inpatient, you're pretty much off any medication. You're in crisis. Yeah. Um, you know, everything's at everything's at 100, right? So that really solidified me wanting to go into doing therapy and and um and just embellish myself in the mental health field. Right, right. So what sparked your initial interest in mental health? My initial interest came from, as a kid, around 13 or 14 years old, talking to my friend's parents, right? They would talk to me about different issues they were having, um, whether it be relationship issues or just issues in life. And we would actually have conversations. Here I am, 14 years old, talking to adults about life things. Right. And they're actually taking into account things I'm saying. So one day I was like, well, you know what? I kind of like doing this. Maybe I should get paid for this, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying, you know, I was, you know, you know, the, the wise person or anything. But, right. Um, I think that just by me listening to them, you know, that, that did wonders. A lot of folks, believe it or not, never feel listened to. And that, that's something very, as simple as it sounds, it's, it's important um, right. to have done, to have done is, you know, be heard. Right, right. Yes, yes, definitely. Because a lot of people feel yeah. like they're not hurt. Okay. Well, right. Absolutely. Okay. So, Absolutely. so, so, how did that experience? How do you think just having that experience kind of helped you as far as interacting with patients? Now, just understanding that listening component from a very young age. Well, one thing I've I've always believed is that you know God gave us two ears and one mouth for one reason, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's to definitely listen and hear and speak and speak as less as possible, um, only when needing to speak. And so, what's helped me now, um, even throughout my career, is being able to listen first, gather as much evidence as as much facts as possible, hear the whole story, um, and gathering all the information I need before I even say anything, right? right. Because what I don't want to do is speak on on something that has it or speak on half a thought versus responding to a full thought. Um, and so that's helped me by, you know, again, clients feeling heard, clients are able to get out everything they want to say without being cut off um, or me assuming anything about the client of, of what, what they're going through, because, you know, things can start off one way, sounding one way. But by the time the, the um, sentence or story is over, you know, something totally different than what you expected. So. Right. It definitely causes me to kind of sit there and just really just focus on, you know, what they're what, what they're trying to convey and, and, and where they're coming from. So that's helped a lot. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, you know, mental health is um, becoming more uh, or people are paying more attention to mental health. And mm-hmm. I know through uh, social media, through certain platforms, I know Charlemagne the God has been one of the people within our community in the media who's been on the forefront of pushing uh People get make sure they take care of their mental health. But um, from your perspective, from your journey and your experience, why is it important for people to pay attention to their mental health? Uh, and as much as uh, as much attention to our mental health as we would to like our physical health or our, our financial health. I would say it's, it's just as important because without a solid mental health foundation, uh, we can end up losing track of ourselves, losing track of life. Right. Because so many people are in this um, daily um, schedule of getting up, going to work or, you know, getting up, taking care of kids, going to work, so forth and so on. And we get in these routines and we tend to we, send, we tend to lose a sense of self. Right. And we, or we tend to take on a lot of stress, not knowing we're taking on stress. So if we're trying right. to lose weight, we realize, oh, I can't lose weight. I don't know why or I'm not sleeping. I don't know why. Or I'm always arguing with my spouse. So I'm not sure why. And a lot of it comes down to just, you know, feeling overwhelmed, feeling stressed. Um, not having proper coping skills and all this results to mental health. You know, a lot of folks have looked at mental health as something as someone, you know, being in a crisis or having a 
severe and persistent mental health ill diagnosis like a schizo like schizophrenia mm -hmm. or um, schizoaffective disorder, but that's not always the case. You know, there's depression, there's anxiety, um, grief, loss and grief, right? There's just, you know, everyday life issues we go through that can impact our mental health. They can shift the way we think or perceive things, right? We can right. start to feel like, you know, people are against us or, you know, people are trying to sabotage us, the world's against us or things like that, or things always, or I'm sorry, bad things always happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, that's not the case. We're just feeling that way, right? We're kind of going off of the emotion and not off the facts. And so what that shows is that we're, we're just, in essence, feeling overwhelmed. And so when we're, when, when, when we're not watching our mental health, we can give into these thoughts or ideations and we can kind of go on a downward spiral in life you know, right. and be more argumentative at work, you know, being cranky, um, okay. you know, at home with the spouse, arguing or nitpicking, fighting, sometimes can lead to infidelity, you know, with the kids, parenting may kind of wane a little bit um, because again, that overwhelming feeling and not really doing a self, what I like to call it self check-in. You know, right. How am I really feeling? How am I doing this week? You know, am I agitated? Am I a little more snappier than usual? Am I drinking a little bit more than I usually drink? Or am I starting to curse a little bit more? Am I, you know, being more negative? If so, why? Instead of, instead of kind of falling into, well, that's just how I am. Let's look at why are we like that, right? And so those are important. I mean, if you have a, if you have a, a, a an ongoing cough where you're, you know, your coughing is burning your chest, waking you up at night, you want to see a doctor eventually. You're not going right. to say, oh, that's just how I am, right? Right. Same thing with mental health, you know. That's so. that's a great analogy. That's a that's a great analogy because I don't I don't think a lot of people understand the difference between uh, your personality and behavior that's not necessarily normal, but has been become has become normalized over time. Right. And so, with you saying that, it makes sense. Like if my foot hurts, like like I tell people all the time, you never really understand how important your pinky toe is until you hurt it or something, right? Man. Right. But <laughs> right. But you're gonna you once you feel that you like after a while, if it's turning blue or something, you're gonna go get it checked out. But absolutely. If I just feel gloomy, if I've been feeling gloomy for two weeks, I'm not gonna get checked out. Okay. So so now with that being said, for somebody who has no idea where to go for mental health care or anything, if they're having these feelings for let's say two, three weeks, maybe a month, what where should they go? What's the first step they should take to seek uh, mental health care? I would say the first step is talking to your primary care physician. Um, because also when we're starting to have these changes, right? Emotional changes. Um, one thing I always like to rule out are is anything physiological going on, right? So let's go to the medical doctor, make sure they're running appropriate tests to make sure there's no chemical imbalances or anything else going on. And once those things are ruled out, even with anxiety, you know, because, you know, some folks can say my heart's racing, I, I can't breathe. Um, and sometimes that's the case. Right. But there are times when it's just, you know, it's a reaction to stress. And so I'd rather the doctor rule out everything, said, OK, no, all the tests are clear. So now let's look at the mental health portion of things. And right. I can definitely refer out or refer you to or you can call 211 um, for mental health providers um, or you can uh, look up a new life on, on the web on Google. Um, mm -hmm. Or just uh, there's also psychology today. You can type in your zip code, and it'll give you a list of all kind of different therapists and um, psychologists in the area as as well. So there are different resources out there to be able to um, find a therapist. But if you want to start from a very very basic level, I would definitely encourage an individual to have a conversation with a primary care physician. Good, good, okay. So uh, reading through your bio, uh, I see that you have experience dealing with patients in crisis. So yes. those of us who are outside of the mental health world, when we hear crisis, I, I know all types of stuff go through my mind that may not be correct, but it's trying to get a better understanding of what does it mean to, what does it mean for a patient to go to crisis and how do you help that patient who's in that crisis moment? Sure. So a crisis is an event or a situation that's causing an, an, a, a dis, immediate disruption and immediate um, dysregulation of a reaction in your life at that moment, right? So a crisis could be anywhere from a car accident to getting evicted from your home um, okay. to, so, you know, anything, you know, pretty much can go from the least case scenario to the worst case scenario because everyone's crisis is different. Gotcha. Now, not all crises require um, hospitalization, but there are crises that can lead to hospitalization, right? If we're, if we're having a psychotic episode, if we're going into psychosis because we, um, smoke some bad weed, or we've been, you know, we had a a death in the family that we're not coping well with. Um, 
also a crisis come, you know, I felt had folks walk in my office and the crisis was, um, you know, how am I going to pay my electric bill today? You know, lights right. are going off, okay. I have kids, I'm worried about it, you know, I'm panicking, hyperventilating, things of that nature. Um, and so when we look at a crisis, if it's pretty much an event that's having an immediate impact on your life at that moment in time. Gotcha. Okay. See, I'm glad you explained that because I was thinking it was a specific mental health crisis, but you were just talking about life, a life, crisis absolutely. within your life. Okay. That, that, see, that that makes sense because I, I think a lot of people like me when they, because it's in the realm of mental health, we just automatically omit life, like right. regular life. And we just go to thinking, well, what's, what is, because basically I wrote my question, what's a mental health crisis? But I just kind of I didn't want to ask it like that, but okay. And I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got. You. I, I could be more specific if you need you need me to. You know, a mental health crisis, um, okay. again, would be more. So now we're talking about going into psychosis, right? Where okay. we're starting to hear things, see things that aren't there. Okay. Um, we're having anxiety or what they call nervous breakdowns in layman terms, anxiety attacks when you're hyperventilating. Um, you know, palms start sweating. Um, you know, your, your underarms may start sweating profusely, head sweating, you can't calm yourself back down, uh, just feeling overly anxious. Um, also, there's what's called panic attacks. That right. could be a crisis, right? A panic attack, you feel like you're having a heart attack almost. Um, and in these crises, really what's happening is it's the inability to cope with what, what the situation is. Let's say, uh -huh. you know, you've seen um, someone get murdered, you were in a, you know, a very severe car accident, you're having flashbacks of the car accident. Um, that can put you into a mental health crisis at that moment in time. Um, that's when, you know, if you are in a place where you're unable to, you know, gather your thoughts, gather your, your composure, you're, you continuously hyperventilate or you're, you right. know, just, you know, you have a friend that's, you know, seeing things and not really that aren't there. That's what's a good, a good job or a good idea to get um, professionals involved, like a, you know, inpatient hospital or um, a crisis intervention trained law officer who, who would prevent that person from hurting themselves. Right. Okay. That, so, all right, that makes sense. All mm -hmm. of that makes sense. Okay. But so there are mental health crises, but there are life crises as well. And life crises can lead to a mental health crisis. Absolutely. They definitely can. I've had folks, you know, come to my office that where I've actually seen crises escalate. Okay. Right? So it goes from, you know, I'm worried about uh, some bills. I can't sleep to now that the crisis is escalating to where not only am I not sleeping, but my wife and I are arguing more. And then they escalated to, I put my hands on my wife, right? Now right. we're at a domestic violence issue, right? Now. Right. Right. So you're calling me in crisis. Hey, I just hit my wife. I don't know what happened. You know, I just kind of blacked out, yada, yada, yada. Now we're right. definitely in a crisis, right? So I have to call. So I'm talking to them, trying to calm them down, talk to wife, walk the, through the, you know, you know, what the, what, what does wife want to do? Call the police, so right. forth and so on. Um, and so, and also to help, help calm the client down, right? Because, yes. you know, you, you did perform an action. I get you in crisis. However, that, you know, we can't hit women. So, there, you know, whatever she decides to do, that's her choice. Um, and so forth and so on. Then, of course, after everything um, was over with, we did, you know, couples counseling to kind of bring it back down. But those, that's a situation where it was like an escalating crisis and that um, not that therapy wasn't working. It was just that there were a lot of environmental factors gotcha. that kept adding more fuel. Right. That. See, all right. So, my it's off the beaten path, but this is quite this question because you made me think about it. So, I hear a lot of uh, not a lot, but I've heard situations where a person is going through a mental health crisis, but the but law enforcement is called. Mm -hmm. So, what what are what should people be doing, or what what's being taught to people who um, find themselves in a situation with somebody going through a mental health crisis instead of calling law enforcement or is there a special type of number that they should be able to call um because it seems like you might not want to call specific law enforcement or you want to call somebody with more of a mental health background to help that person in that situation there is actually i know um so i know around leon county at least mm -hmm. they've been um conducting classes for officers uh, i believe for the sheriff's department tpd um, and maybe a few other agencies where they can receive training to become a crisis intervention trained officer to handle mental health calls. Um, currently, uh, the Appalachian Center has teamed with the Leon County Sheriff's Office to where when there are um, crisis calls for someone having a mental health crisis or they're a danger to themselves or someone else, mm -hmm. um, what they would do is bring a licensed therapist or a therapist from Appalachian Center with them on the call 
Gotcha. To that person to see if they need to be Baker acted or they can be, you know, um, they can be talked down. So there are some programs in place. So, you know, if someone does make a call, I would recommend calling the sheriff's office directly, you know, explain them the situation, asking for either a crisis intervention trained officer or CIT for short, um, or asking that they bring law enforcement with a with the therapist. I forgot the exact team name that mm-hmm. Appalachian and the Sheriff's Department have, um, they have, but I know that they do have someone going out with them on, on those calls. Gotcha. And then you you also talked about environmental factors because that's one mm-hmm. thing that I, I think about a lot. Just working in environments that I work in and living in environments I live in, I, I, I encounter a lot of people who they have mental health issues and it seems I don't I'm not a special uh, you know, specialist, whatever. So I don't want to diagnose them, but seeing these people in these specific environments for a number of years and seeing how their condition has continued over the years, how much of a factor is the environment on a person's mental health as far as uh, adding to the decline of their mental health? I believe the environment plays a huge part on a person's mental health. Um, you know, just living from, you know, li- you know, being from New Jersey, coming down to Florida, right? A total different environment. I never forget right. one year. This is a quick example. One year when I was down here, went back home to visit family and everything. And for three days, I felt so low, no energy, just unmotivated, irritable, um, kind of like, you know, why am I here? Mm. And so on. The one day I sat in my mom's kitchen, I looked out the window and I noticed I haven't seen the sun in three or four days. Right. And so being used to being in Florida, seeing the sun every day, which, you know, is gives you energy boost. You, right. you, see, you want to move. Right. That right. had a whole effect on my whole mood, you know, to where everyone's looking like, oh, what's wrong with you? Right. And I realized I'm like, wait a minute. I haven't seen the sun. It's, it's been cloudy four or five days right. um, and cooler than usual. So, right. you know, that just that weather environment plays a part. So now when we look at the actual, you know, what you see around yourself and when you're surrounded by, you know, things, um, uh, let's say like a poverty, impoverished environment. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not seeing a lot of positive things happen. You know, you're not seeing people get up going to work, you know, regularly all the time. Um, you may see folks, you know, handling situations different um, than other environments, but handle situations, you know, there may be, you know, people, do, you know, do what they know to do, you know, hey, right. I'm disrespected. Hey, we're fighting, we're yelling, we're cursing. Um, other places they may sit there, you know, want to talk things out. Um, not say it doesn't happen in, in impoverished environments, uh, what, I'm, what I am saying is that, you know, different environments can offer, depending on who's around you, can shape your mentality, right? Because even in, I've, I've dealt with clients that come from multi, multi-million dollar homes, but but mom mom likes to drink and dad has extra matter affairs, yeah. right? And so in, in that environment, so mom and dad get together, there's what? A lot of yelling, cursing, so forth and so on. Um, so with the child, what, 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 what does he learn? Oh, when I get angry, I can yell a curse. Yeah. I can try to drink underage because I, I see mom doing that. So with and so on. Um, or other kids that want to become that doctor, that lawyer. Yeah, I want to do that. But, you know, that's when I, go, I come home, you know, mom's telling me we got to pack up and get ready to move somewhere. I can't get yeah. stable. Right. So, you know, all these different things kind of play into, especially a child, um, their, their overall development, you know. Gotcha. Um, and for adults as well. Gotcha. So. But that make that definitely makes sense because um, I never thought about it in that in that capacity of, uh, with your explanation. Because you know, being in Florida, we we see the sun a lot. But I, I mm-hmm. guess I, I can I would better understand it from my experiences in the winter time. I'm not I'm not as friendly in the winter as I am in the summertime. Cause I mm-hmm. like the colder it is, the more irritable that I am, and I just no, it's not exactly. Working. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> So exactly right. So in addition to uh, working with patients that are going through crisis, you've also uh, worked in the capacity of detoxing when it comes to mental health. Now mm-hmm. I'm I'm familiar with detox and substance uh, and substance abuse, but not necessarily detox and mental health. Is there a connection between the two? Um, there are. Uh, so you know, my primary focus is mental health. You know, I've I've, I've worked with um, the substance abuse side, but I've, I've intentionally been limited in that Mm -hmm. um, because I haven't had that much of an interest in working in that, you know, with with that particular um, diagnosis. However, they are um, interconnected, you know, and there are times where the substance abuse can lead to a mental health disorder. And there are times where having a mental health disorder can lead to being having substance abuse, right? Because we want to cope um, with, with what we have going on with us. And so when 
when we're interlocking the two of them, that definitely makes therapy that much dif more difficult. Um, again, which is why I've intentionally kind of shied away from that arena mm -hmm. and just focused on mental health because when you introduce substance abuse, you know, it takes a while to figure out, okay, which, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Right. And then, and then once you, once you identified it, now you're trying to fight, you know, that's just two battles versus just one battle, you know, because uh, a person, let's say, you know, if they're addicted to alcoholism, mm -hmm. okay, we get that under control, but now the bipolar is still there, right? And now we're acting worse. Right. So when we were drinking, we we're a functioning alcoholic, we we're killing our body, unfortunately. However, we won't have that many bipolar episodes. So it's, it's that kind of continuous, um, seesaw you're on um you know with that so which is why I, i've been limited in my in my work with that right okay okay that that's because when i saw it i was like I, I know i was i know what my mind went to because i still do classes at this village i've done that for mm -hmm. about 10 years so dealing with that in that capacity but just just getting that understanding okay yeah so so in addition to that um forensics is is another um area that mm -hmm. you've worked in so now now you know when you say forensics you know mm -hmm. csi that messed us all up yeah <laughs> so and everybody everybody think they're a forensics expert but when we hear forensics we automatically go to some crime scene investigation so right how was forensics used in mental health so forensic is, is basically dealing with the, the the criminal right um and so People that have been um, found insane um, or not not good to a reason of insanity or have been found to be um, insane at the time of the crime, they go into what's called a forensics program. Okay. Right. And so it's not always dealing with this death, but it's more so dealing with the person who has you know committed a crime, but they look at this, their state of their mental capacity at the time of the crime. And so when I worked with forensics um, at, at one of my previous employers, they had a forensic housing unit. And these are all um, folks who were being stepped down from the prison level or the Florida State Hospital level and, and working their way to transition to the community. Mm -hmm. And so one forensic unit was a little bit more secure than the other. Uh, one didn't allow for you know folks to go out you know, to the stores, walk around um, without being supervised, you know, than, than another one did. And so uh, working with them, you know, it, it was all male facility. You know, the guys were great. Um, one thing I've learned is that, you know, there definitely is a need um, for a forensics court, mental health court, um, because a lot of times people do commit crimes not fully knowing what they're doing. You know, because okay. again, if they're right. in a state of psychosis right. um, or they're having, you know, a schizophrenic episode, they may not, they, they truly may not fully be, you know, aware of their actions. You know, if they weren't on, on medication, because there's a time where your brain can just kind of switch and you turn into a different person. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's science to back that, right? And and so um, with this, with these programs and, and people come back and get to, into the community, which was really good to see, it showed that they, you know, not only paid their debt to society, but they're also taking the steps to get the psychological help they needed to ensure they don't make these mistakes again. You know, getting getting right medications, going through therapy, you know, other different programs. And I'm talking about years, like you know, 10, mm -hmm. 20 years of of, the, of these different um, steps to ensure that they've been rehabilitated to be a functional, productive member of society. Right. Gotcha. So what was what was that experience like um, working with those patients? who uh, were in that specific environment or that moment um, dealing with forensics, what was that experience like? That experience was a very unique experience uh, because when you read the charts and see what, what the folks were convicted of and you meet the person, it's like night and day. Yeah. Right. And so <laughs> you're looking like, wait, this happened? But then you meet them, one of the nicest people you ever meet, um, a lot of them very well spoken, very intelligent um individuals and you know one of the things they 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 looked for was respect you know and one of the things um the reason why we got along when i was working with them because i did my internship with them so i would conduct groups um and just talk with them and the reason they they even told me one day why they were responsive to what i was to my groups was because i actually treated them with respect you know you know mm -hmm. one guy said i went through 25 30 years of being talked down to hit so forth and so on but you actually look look me in my eye you know simple things like that and so right. Um, my experience working with them is that, you know, what, one thing I've learned is that you can never judge a book by its cover. Right. Right. And that we, we all have a past. Um, however, I feel that no matter what we've done in life, 
um, that everybody deserves to have a fresh start in life. That's one of the things I put on my my site. And that's why I you know, got into therapy because we can't, you know, if we all let our past define who, who we are, a lot of us wouldn't be where we are today. You know, right. so and so in helping them understand that, hey, you know, these things may have happened. Yes. However, we have a chance for a fresh start. And I really think a lot of them took a hold to that, you know, for what they could to ensure that they, you know, when, when they're out in the community, they didn't, uh, they weren't any repeat of offenders. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now that's, 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 that's great. Because the, I hope, hope the, they answered the question. <laughs> yeah, 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 you did. You, you knocked that out the park, <laughs> you know, but, but that's great because I don't, I don't think a lot of people really have the mindset of helping people get better and move forward because we can't just admonish people, punish them, then put them back into society with no repairing of those people. And right. we want we want those people to come back out and be productive citizens. And yes, this is what happened in your past, but the rest of your life won't be defined by what happened uh, in your past, especially when you put the time and the work in to make sure that you change yourself. So, right. Uh, so that's Absolutely. that's a yeah. that's a service that's appreciated. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's support. It's, and, I, and I apply that principle to everybody. Right. You know, right. whether it's just, the, you know, the, it, could, it could be a CEO of, of Fortune 500 company to, you know, the criminal to um, working class person, whoever. You know, we definitely yeah. don't want to let our past define us. We, we, we right. have to be able to move forward in life. Right. 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 So working at working, being able to work at various capacities within the mental health field uh, mm -hmm. from case manager on up to a uh, program director, assistant program director. So just trying to get a, a, a sense of your mindset. What's the difference in the mindset that you have to have as a program director in a mental health facility as uh, from difference that somebody may be a case manager or just getting started in the in the field? Uh, the difference is, so when we look at the case managers or therapists, they're on a clinical level. Mm -hmm. um, the case manager's job is to ensure that the basic needs are met, you know, folk who, uh, food, clothing, shelter. Mm -hmm. The therapists are there to ensure that um, the 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 person is becoming uh, you know as self actualized as possible, become the best person they can be. The a program or assistant program director's job is to ensure that the therapist and case manager are following the policies of the of the agency, as well as following the um, being ethical in their practice. Right, and so it's more the administrative side. So we don't necessarily see clients as often versus monitoring the, the work um, the therapists or case managers are doing. So, yes. you know, so a pro, assistant program director will review charts, hold meetings, look at numbers as far as um, how much billing is being done, um, you know, how, how fast the notes being closed, all that, all the stuff no one really uh, wants to do <laughs> necessarily. Right. But we got to monitor it to make sure it's being done because in <laughs> essence, if notes aren't closed in time to submit for billing, then that holds up, you know, the funding from, the insurance companies, which then holds up the money from you know being bills getting paid. So you know you know one plus one does equal two. You know even in right. this other business. So you know our job is that middle ground is to ensure that the um the, the groundwork is being laid. You know uh, in a in a strong foundation level, so that we can continue running the program. You know and of course um, one one of the ongoing things is that the policy side never sees eye to eye with the clinical side. Right, it's always an ongoing battle. So, so now to hold my meetings and pass down new policies and new procedures, you know, there was always, you know, um, spirited feedback from mm -hmm. case managers, therapists. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we had to kind of help them process through it, remind them, hey, you know, I still do therapy from time to time. You know, I'm right there with you guys. I think that helped them a lot to know my boots are still in the ground. Uh, maybe not right. as, I'm not stomping as hard as they were stomping, but my boots are still there, you know, right. on the line. I'm not sitting up high looking down. So, right. I think they respected that. And so, you know, admittedly, you know, being able to find the balance to keep them motivated while the changes are constantly coming or while, you know, they're hearing the same thing over and over again, that can become nauseating. Um, I think it definitely is a, a, a challenge to keep everybody motivated to, to want to keep working, right? Because it's easy to become unmotivated when you're hearing mm -hmm. everything you're not doing well versus right. what you are doing. Right, right. Now that, but that's, that's cool. So like, because I was going to ask, do you ever, uh, I was going to use the term you ever missed the game, but uh, miss being being out there. But you do therapy from time to time. But are, are there times as the administrator, you're like, man, I just want to go back and do some therapy. <laughs> so currently, you know, as the owner of my own, own practice, I'm still doing therapy. Um, yes. Not as 
I'm not. Um, so when I first started doing therapy, I was going six days a week, seeing about 30, 35 clients a week. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm down to about 15, 20 clients a week of higher people work under me. So I'm still involved, not as involved. Um, I think I found a good balance to where I can't say I miss it, but I can't say I want to do more than what I'm doing right now. <laughs> yes. The reason being, because, you know, as the owner, my job is to grow the business. You know, I don't want mm-hmm. to stay stagnant. So mm-hmm. now I think that the challenge for me, actually, Joe, is being able to get into more of an administrative mind than the clinical mind. Yes. So, my, my, yeah. so I brought my wife on to help me out uh, because she has, an administ- she has an administrative mindset. Mm-hmm. Um to help the practice grow more um, as, as far as, you know, different locations, what makes the most sense, um, both financially and clinically um, versus looking at it from a clinical standpoint. So I think that's my biggest challenge is actually wanting to, or kind of forcing myself to keep that administrative eye, set, eye on me versus, you know, dwindling back to the clinical, like, well, I think it's better like this, you right. know, clinically, but, you know, unfortunately clinical doesn't pay the, doesn't get the bills paid. You, know you got to have administrative mind, but but that, that's it. that's good leadership and good uh, and just good sight period to understand. All right, I'm gonna get somebody else to come in and do this part yes. to help me with this part to be able to help me grow this skill set in myself. But that right. that's just that's just smart and good leadership. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah one thing I'm, I'm not afraid to say are things I don't know how to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because you know I I respect people who say that they don't know because we can go mm-hmm. learn together. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so how many years did you work in mental health before you started your own business? Um, so I started in 2006, started my practice in 2020. So was that about 14 years? Okay. Okay. Been... So, so over the past 14 years, what, are, what are some lessons or experiences that, that you've had that you but you feel that has helped you be able to start your own practice and be able to be here where you are right now. Uh, one of the experience I've learned is that, you know, I always, I keep God first, you know, I pray every day. Um, I get counsel from my, you know, my apostles, spiritual guidance, things of that nature. Um, and, I, and I think just that spiritual walk has really helped me get to where I am, kind of understand the vision that God had for me, you know, ensuring that I was aligned with walking where he wanted to walk. And, um, you know, cause, you know, here, one of the things I always, you know, had a vision of was to have my own practice. But I told the Lord, so, okay, God, if I get this practice, I'm turning back over to you because I don't know what I'm doing, right? And so, uh, you know, in, in my, part of my daily prayer every morning is, okay, you know, this is your practice. Show me what you want me to do every day. And, you know, just miraculous things have happened, you know, within this practice. So I, I know the vision's been there, but the actual the steps to take and all that, I think, you know, by me learning, him, God putting me in places to be able to absorb information has helped a lot, especially as a um, assistant program director. I sat in a lot of administrative meetings where, you know, the owner was there, the, um, C- the CEO was there, CFO was present. We would do um, SWAT, you know, strength, weaknesses, assessments. Mm-hmm. Um, we would do all the different, um, you know, techniques and have c- and conversations about, um, about, you know, planning, forecasting for the next year all the different things. And I was previous to all this information, you know, to see how, how the conversations went, to see how the meetings were conducted, um, who who did what, you know, because the owner where, where I used to work, he and his wife started off, you know, as a small mental health practice, you know, just doing, right. doing case management and they grew from there. And so I and just, and just being able to sit in on those meetings, learning how to um, even conduct an, a meeting like that, how to think in that membership level or know what questions to ask. I think that's been a benefit for me as well on the clinical level just learning to understand people has been helpful um understanding that you know everybody's story in, in some form or fashion is different you know they may have the same um it may sound the same but once you start digging in it's different which again goes back to what i was talking about earlier about listening and be able to listen you know i've, I've developed great listening skills um and helping folks because the key is also as a therapist is you want to keep folks coming back to you you know, at that first session. And it, and it's it's not most, so much as being a salesman, but it's almost be, it's being able to show the person in front of you, hey, you know, I really care about what you have to say and what you're going through, you know, on the clinical level. And so I've developed that skill because, you know, I've developed a passion for people. And I've always had a passion for people because, you know, I've come across so many folks that are hurting um, yes. and there's not much I can do about that, you know, but provide right. a right listening ear or some encouragement. Right. And so being able to just sit there and just hear what they're saying, validate their feelings, um, that's how my clinical my clinical skill set, as well as being under some great clinicians as well, um, who that taught helps. me different, you know, 
different procedures. I, I know my last place of employment, my program director, she was a phenomenal therapist, you know, asked great questions. And of course, to this day, she never, she would tell you, I don't want to do therapy anymore. I'm fine from that. But just talking with her, you know, staffing cases with her, I mean, she was phenomenal. Um, and the questions she would ask, the ideas she had, you know, um, definitely, you know, and grateful for her as well. Um, and just other people in my life that I would speak to, you know, one of the things I think was a huge benefit, Joe, was not wanting to be the know-it-all, you know, not wanting yeah. to be the smartest person in the room, not wanting yeah. to be the person that says, I know all about therapy, you don't, you know, I'm like, hey, I want to learn from what, what you have. And um, even further, the skill set, believe it or not, we have interns that, that come in during the internship. You know, right now we have a contract with um, FSU working, working towards getting on with FAMU later on. Um, but when the students come in, they, um, for the internships, one of the things I ask them is, okay, what can you teach us? Mm-hmm. You know, that's <laughs> you know, a great question. To teach you um, yeah. because they're fresh minds. You know, they're still in the class. They have the up to most research there and everything else. And they've asked great questions, you know, and it's different. It's always good to have, get opinions from different eye sets, you know, because if you look at something over and over again, you may not, you may miss something versus someone else with fresh eyes coming in. Right. Um, and so having that open mind has been instrumental for me as well in my mental and helping the practice grow um, also. That's good. That's that. That's yeah. amazing. That's great. So I that was a long answer. I'm sorry. No, it's good. It, it, make sure. <laughs> it's good. It's good. They, that's a good answer. <laughs> it's a good answer. So that's all that matters. <laughs> so so brag about you brag about a new life consulting and counseling and consulting. Tell us about it. What services do you provide? Um, how do you use your services to help the people and everything? Where are you located? Okay, so a new life counseling consulting, we provide mental health services as, as well as consulting services. So on the mental health side, we do individual um, therapy, family therapy, marital therapy, also offer, also offer Christian counseling as well, if that's what the person requests. Um, and I always make that known to the, that, you know, people, I don't want them thinking we're going to throw the Bible at them as soon as they walk in, right? <laughs> if you're not there for that, that's not what you're getting. You know, you only get what you're there for. Um, but we, um, but um, we, you know, we pretty much open to open to open to the community to everybody. We accept um, most commercial insurances, and as well as we accept uh, stay well Medicaid. Also, um, we and our and our purpose is to you know again help others find their 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 time in the sun, you know, and be able to find that new life that they're they've been looking for. Um so that they're not stuck in, you know, living in their past or letting the past define them as we talked about earlier, but you know, you know, looking forward to that a new life anew. Right. 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 And so a new life really is a play on words because you know, um mm-hmm. uh, because you know it's, it's a fresh start, but it's a fresh start with your life, right? Going yeah. forward, um, versus staying stagnant in the past. That's what we try to do. As far as the community um, you know, we started during the midst of COVID, so we haven't really had a chance to attend a lot of the community events um, or really be hands, hand, you know, boots down in the community like I've wanted to because just because, because of COVID. But now that things are opening up. That is a kind of ongoing conversation, how we can participate more in community events and contribute more to the community as well. Hey, man, um, you know, you can all, you always welcome to come out and do things with me. Matter of fact, we have a food drive right. this, this Thursday from 1031. If you want to come set up a table, you're more than welcome. Okay, okay, okay. Um, what I would say, I, I, I know this week I'm booked with everything, but upcoming things that you all may have, let me oh, know yeah. either myself or my assistant can be there. Somebody can be there representing. I'm going to put you on my email okay. list. So when I send things out, all you got to do is just somebody reply and say, we want to be there and you already know you're good. Oh yeah, yeah, we would love to be there, and you know, and it's not just for us to get our name out, but just to help, yep. you know, assist any way possible, help give back to the community, um, because we believe that you know a strong community will definitely yield strong mental health. Right. Have you have you thought about partnering with churches, uh, different churches, to help with the capacity of counseling, and especially offering Christian counseling? So we've gotten calls. So I, I've we haven't partnered with a church per se. Um, well, there's one church that has us on their list as a, as a re- referral um, source. Uh, well, we have gotten calls from churches, from pastors um, that, you know, refer some of their members to us because, and I, I can appreciate that because what these pastors have recognized is that, you know, like myself, we all have our own, we have, we have limitations, we have a scope that we, we have to stay within, right? And they recognize, okay, you know, I can, I can counsel you up to this point as, as your pastor, 
But after that, you know, there may be there's a p- place where it's like, okay, maybe you need a professional right now, right. which I can truly appreciate because historically, a lot of you know, especially in the black churches, oh, go talk to the pastor, it'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes the pastor can help. Sometimes the pastor may say the wrong thing. You know, depending right. on what's right. going on. Um, and it's not that they intentionally did it, but this may not be their scope of practice, which is okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've gotten referrals from pastors. I've even you know counseled some pastors, which has been awesome experience. Um, and which have led to them said, hey, I'm some some of my members here as well. Um, but um, as far as going to the church and saying, hey, we're here. I haven't fully done that yet either. And again, these are all things that I, I really want to work on, which is why I've reduced my caseload so I can start, you know, kind of getting our name out more and doing doing some more now that we have some more solid footing and I have, and I have a great group of therapists that work under me right now. So or, I'm sorry, work with me, not under me, but with me because they are definitely brains this operation too <laughs> um, that, that are helpful. Also, we, um, we're, you know, we're, we're predominantly female staffed. I'm, I'm the only male right now. So I'm definitely... I definitely would love to bring on another male therapist. Um, it's just, you know, it's definitely hard to find. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we're also looking towards is, is to uh, become more diverse. Uh, right now, we're all African American. Um, I like the idea of diversity because, you know, when clients come, they may prefer a black male therapist, maybe a white male therapist, maybe a white female therapist, uh, whatever the case may be. So I want to make sure that we can meet the need of any client that comes on. Yes. Yes. That's what's up. Mm-hmm. So, um, we have stigma in our community when it comes yeah. to mental health. Um, I know you you have you you're doing your work, a new life counseling consulting is 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 available. How how are you and your uh, your organization and your staff, how are you guys working to combat the stigma, particularly in our community? Like I said, I think things are better now, but there's mm-hmm. still a lot of stigma. So how are you guys working to combat the stigma to be able to um get other people to understand that help us help you. So what we've done, um, and again, within the midst of COVID is when family members will call, because one thing you did say it is getting better, which I agree, getting Uh better, meaning parents are recognizing it, friends are recognizing it, you know, spouses recognizing it. Um, I think a challenge has been, especially for African-American males, being able to say, okay, okay, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do therapy. Um, and a lot of it has been because they have not been able to find someone who looks like them to talk to, right? which I understand. So when a wife or mom, you know, sees my picture somewhere, they'll call and say, Hey, you know, I have a husband I have a, or a son, nephew, who I think, you know, would be great. However, um, so, um, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for somebody that can, you know, help yada, yada, yada. And what I would do then is, um, call that person, call the nephew, call the father, call the husband. And say, hey, look, you know, I'm Drake, seven third, you know, at least um schedule 15 minutes just to talk with me, you know, a little bit. And so that's the part I'm doing to kind of get them to get their mind rolling about therapy. And sometimes it would pan out to, you know, they would come on for sessions. Some would still say, No, I'm okay. Um, but you know, that's kind of where we where we are now. I think we will be able to do more as we're participating in more community events, kind of, you know, helping break the stigma. Um, and, and that's where the consulting part comes in, you know, talking mm-hmm. more about, you know, the benefits of therapy. Um, that therapy is, you know, receiving therapy doesn't mean that you're in crisis or doesn't mean that you have this severe persistent mental illness. Um, I'll, you know, it can simply just mean that, hey, you know, we're we're down, we're having a rough time, you know, I need someone to talk to, I'm trying to figure out life, uh, I'm trying to look, figure out how to navigate COVID, trying to navigate inflation, you know, all these different things. So um, we're, we're trying to get our name out there, you know, more, you know, bit by bit, but also um, reduce the stigma a little bit more, even by, you know, admitting to others hey i've gotten therapy myself you know yeah it's, it's, it's not you know it's, it's not the worst thing in the world person i feel everybody should go through a session or two of therapy just to be able to kind of you know voice concerns have that sounding board of, of releasing any yeah. frustrations yeah um i i know i need to do it myself um just because i don't i just i mean i ain't gonna say nothing that's all so i just i know i need to try it myself but now uh, and this is one of the last things i want to ask because I, I see it a lot and i one of the reasons why i know um the stigma is decreasing in in our community because we, i'm hearing more people talk about it mm-hmm. but i think i'm i think i'm seeing a lot more people self-diagnose and because I see a lot of people, I'm going through depression. I was going through depression. I was going through depression. And a lot of these people I want to ask were, were you clinically diagnosed with depression? 
or mm-hmm. is or is it something that you're giving yourself? So what what tips would you give to to somebody who may think that they're experiencing depression, but maybe self-diagnosing themselves to to better get a full uh, grasp on where they are? What, what, I would, what I would say to them is if you do not have a healthy release, working out, meditating, praying, walking, um, if you don't have a healthy release, um, I would encourage you to where you can manage it on your own. I would encourage you to talk to a professional. If it continues to, and for that person who does have a healthy release, if it continues to come back, or if you find yourself getting to more of a deeper state of depression or getting to depressed more often, I would encourage you to talk to a professional about it. Um, because it may be a little bit more than just depression. And and sometimes the danger of self-diagnosing is that we may focus on just one symptom and maybe um aligning that with, oh well, you know, um, for example, you know, with the weather change, oh, the weather change is colder out. I don't like the, I like the cold weather. Or maybe it's I don't like the cold weather because during this time four years ago, someone close to me passed, I haven't gotten right. to it yet. Right? right. So it could be a little deeper than that. So I would always encourage you know, even for those who don't have a way of help, help um, coping in the healthiest way is that, hey, co- reach out to a therapist, have a session, talk to them about it. I mean, same thing with the doctor. If you're, again, if you're aching and the ache keeps coming back, you know, like, especially with men, if we have a cold or something and, and it goes away, all right, we're good. I'm not going to the doctor. I keep keep moving, right? But again, if it keeps coming back or if it lasts longer than we think it should, um, okay, we're, we're going to go see somebody. Um, and I think I would say it's the same thing for anybody dealing with, you know, any kind of depression, anxiety, um, uh, um, not sleeping well, you know, loss of appetite, um, you know, loss of motivation. And we talk about depression, we have to really define what depression is and the symptoms of it. Because some folks may say I'm depressed and just feeling low for a day or two doesn't necessarily mean you're depressed necessarily. It could mean you just don't have any lack of, you have lack of energy for whatever reason, right? Um, and so, but if you're having these different symptoms, you know, not interested in things you used to be interested in, um, thoughts of suicide or thoughts of hurting yourself or somebody else, um, no no motivation, um, feeling hopeless, feeling helpless. Now we're talking about these ongoing symptoms. This is where we're looking at, okay, I definitely might need to talk to somebody. And it's okay to talk to someone because all the you know the purpose of it is to get is to be able to be your best self. You know, we don't want right. to live a life because life is short as, as it already is. And we don't want to live this life of uh, in constant misery and constant pain. We want to be as healthy and happy as possible exactly. so we can enjoy every day that we get. Exactly. Exactly. See, that's why we have him on this podcast. I know you learned a lot. I know your mind has been clean because <laughs> um, he, he he does he does his, he does a great job at what he does. So, somebody see this interview. Say, I love the information this young man is giving. He, he's articulate. He's he's poised. He's he's well versed on this information. How could people get in contact with you? Well, they can go to my website. Website a new life ccgroup.com that's a n e w l i f e c c group.com or they can give us a call 850-508-4624 they can call or text that number um if you call that number cuz uh you may get myself or my assistant jordan cuz i do forward that call throughout the day so i can focus on every other things or you may get my like i say you may get me directly um but those are the two ways you can get us also um we are on Instagram, but I do not remember the Instagram handle at this time. But if you type in a new life counseling, it should come up. Um, we just started that 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 um, Instagram page, and I have someone actually working it for me, so yeah. I didn't write it down today. But um, but again, the website, the phone number, the the best ways to catch us. Um, also, we are on a Psychology Today. If you go on PsychologyToday.com, type in a new life counseling, or type in your zip code. If you're in the Tallahassee area, it will come up. Um, and again, feel free to reach send us an email, give us a call, and we'll you know get right get, get back to you, and, and we'll look forward to getting you started. There you go. And and his contact information is in the description, so make sure you scroll down in the description if you want to get be able to get in contact with him and visit the website, send him an email, or anything. I told y'all, I told y'all, I told y'all, I told y'all. That's why he's the man, Mr. Drake Gunning, CEO of a New Life Counseling and Consulting, and. He's using his talents to make his community better, and we can't ask him to do nothing more than that. So, y'all know how we do it. I am Joseph Ward. Shout out to Matias. He can Matias out in these COVID streets, but now he's doing a lot helping, uh, helping with our clinics and doing COVID testing. So, shout out to Mr. Matias. And remember that 
Mind Your Body and Soul is the healthiest podcast you have ever heard in your entire life. We seek to, it's a, also an educational podcast that focuses on all things health related to help our listeners learn more about various health topics and information they may not have access to. We seek to inform, empower, uplift, and mobilize our listeners to become the healthiest versions of themselves. Remember, check us out on a weekly basis on our website at www.nmcpodcast.com, as well as our parental website at www.neighborhoodmedicalcenter.org. We're also available on Anchor, Breaker, Radio, Public Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Like this video, share, and get in the comments. Get in the comments, get in the comments. Let's tell us what you all think. That being said, we'll see y'all next time, y'all. Stay safe, stay healthy. And stay cool because it's hot outside too. So make sure y'all drink a lot of water and we'll see y'all next time. Peace out.